Welcome to the New Church Podcast. I've been caught stealing once when I was five. I enjoy stealing. It's just as simple as that. Well, it's just a simple fact. When I want something and I don't want to pay for it, I walk right through the door. And if I get by, it's mine. Mine, all mine. (laughs) You guys recognize those lyrics? Some of you do, some don't. That was a big song by Jane's Addiction in the 90s. I did actually steal a toy truck from a neighbor kid when I was four or five years old. I took it home, and my mom asked where I got that fancy new truck. And I didn't want to tell her, but I did, and then she made me take it back. It wasn't mine, (laughs) which is kind of funny, because she used to go out with her best friend and look for what they called yard specials. See, a yard special is when someone leaves their bike or something in their front yard close enough to the street that they could grab it and throw it in the back of their car before anyone saw them. Now, I don't think my mom ever lifted anything for us, but I know she thought it was fun to go with her friend. One of my older brothers He got our whole family kicked out of our small town grocery store one year. When he was in high school, he would wear one of those puffy back to the future jackets and he would hide entire boxes of Twinkies and Ding Dongs and then he would go to school and hand them out like a rock star. I think he made the mistake of giving one to the son of the guy who owned the grocery store. So the Hart Boys got banned. I knew a guy who thought it was okay to take stuff from work as long as they were just going to throw those things away anyway. And he was fired for loading up his truck with trash bags and paper towels. You know, because they were going to throw them away anyway. In 1987, I was in a band called Love in Gray. And I had graduated from college. I was working construction in Springfield, Missouri. I was saving up my money to buy a really nice bass guitar and bass amp. And I traded my guitar, my old bass, and a keyboard. I traded everything I owned, plus a big wad of cash, to get some really nice gear. Because we were getting ready to move to Texas and work with a music production company. See how far this band could go. Well, Wild Silas Music Works, they had this nice office with rehearsal space and storage. And they agreed to let us keep our band's stuff there and to use the rehearsal studio. But one week after we moved all our gear into that place, it was robbed, which left me broke and without any musical instruments at all. Like, they took all my tools and my trade. Well, I borrowed a bass, I borrowed an amp from a friend, and one night when we were playing at Fitzgerald's, someone broke into my van and stole my actual toolbox and all of my tools. Kim actually saw him do it, and she chased the person down the street, yelling at him, trying to get my tools back. I'm not sure what she thought she was going to do if she actually caught up with them. (laughs) Can we all agree that thieves suck? That there's not much worse than that sickening feeling that you get when you find out someone has stolen something from you. I mean, especially if they broke into your house or they broke into your car to take it. Because it makes you feel vulnerable, violated. As we continue in this How to Be a Human Being series, we're looking at the seventh commandment. You shall not steal. Well, Luther says that 
the seventh commandment means that we should fear and love God so much that we don't take our neighbor's stuff. We don't take their money or their things by false dealings or tricking them or grabbing their stuff when they're not watching. He says this commandment covers every kind of robbery, theft, usury, fraud, all those things that come from the envy and covetousness of our heart. You shall not steal. But Luther also insists that there's another side to this commandment. It's not just about taking things from our neighbor. It's also about doing whatever we can to help our neighbor, to help them improve and protect their property and their business and their livelihood. I think we need to zoom out and look at all the vocations that we have in life to see all the different ways that we're tempted to steal from each other and steal from God. It's a bigger problem than it might seem on the surface. A good friend of mine, his son, stole a piece of candy from a small grocery store. And when he noticed his son had this piece of candy, he asked where he got it. Kid didn't want to admit it, but he finally said, he took it from the store. It was like a 25 piece of cent, 25 cent piece of candy. So they went back to the store and he told his store, he told his son to apologize to the store owner and pay for the candy. So the boy walks up to the owner like so slowly, like tears are starting to form in his eyes. He actually breaks into full on crying before he finishes saying that he was sorry. Well, the owner, he thanked him for confessing his crime. And then he winked at the dad and said, now, since you came back and paid for it, I'm not going to call the police this time. (laughs) We have to teach our kids not to steal. But that's going to be pretty hard to do in this upside down world that's gone completely mad. I mean, it's obvious we shouldn't steal toys from the neighbor kids or tools from people who are just trying to make a living. But stealing is a much bigger issue than just taking other people's property because it also involves cheating, fraud, scams, and schemes. It includes waste. It includes laziness, which is stealing time from our employer, wasting the time that God has given us to do the things that he told us to be busy doing with our life. Playtime and leisure, that stuff is fine. But what percent of our day, what percent of our life is okay to twiddle away on social media, video games, television, YouTube, Netflix? Because all those things are time thieves how many days a week is it acceptable to dedicate to sports or hobbies before it should be considered stealing from our family or our employer or our church jesus said the harvest is plentiful but the workers are so few probably because they're so busy with their idle distractions and greedy pursuits. Proverbs, it calls us sluggards when we're lazy, when we steal God's time, when we waste our lives. You know, stealing also includes governments that overtax the people. And it includes our politics when we support candidates that promote overtaxation. We seem to have a growing population in this country who want to encourage the government to steal from the people. Overtaxation is theft. It just is. Stealing also includes charging high interest on loans. And when we sit by and allow criminals to take advantage of desperate people 
with high interest loans. I mean, God has a lot to say about all these things. He has a lot to say about stealing, which includes robbing him of tithes and offerings, the things that he commanded us to give him. All through the Bible, it it condemns all these things as violations of the seventh commandment. So before we teach our kids not to steal, we're going to have to learn it ourselves. All these things have been written down for us. We just have to take the time to read and listen to what God has told us. For example, God says, if you're a thief, quit stealing. And instead, use your hands for good, hard work. And then give generously to others who are in need. He says to be honest with your dealings with people. Like honest measurements, your scales and weights, they have to be accurate. You know, it's always been the rule at our house that if you share something like a piece of cake with someone, then one person cuts it, but the other person chooses which piece is theirs. We're supposed to be the kind of people who are generous. We're supposed to be known for helping people. But we're not supposed to take advantage of people when they're down. Leviticus, it says, don't charge interest or make a profit at someone's expense. Instead, show your fear of God by letting them live with you as your relative. Don't charge interest on money you lend someone. Don't make a profit on food you sell people. Now, this is talking about all of us as individuals. It's not talking about our businesses. It's not talking about banks and restaurants and hotels. But speaking of businesses, you know how everyone's always looking for that friend, that Christian friend who can help them get a good deal on something, get the bro discount? What if sometimes we paid extra to bless our brothers and sisters in Christ? instead of always looking just to take advantage of their kindness. Wouldn't that be something? Because God says, you must not muzzle an ox to keep it from eating as it treads out the grain. In other words, those who work deserve to be paid. And then, on the other hand, those who are unwilling to work, God says they don't get to eat. You don't work, you don't eat. It's that simple. And supporting government policies that reward laziness, it's just as bad. And if you borrow money from someone, make sure you pay it back. But don't loan anyone anything if it's going to ruin your relationship, if they don't pay it back. The wicked borrow and never repay, but the godly are generous givers. Givers. Because if someone asks you for something and you can afford to give it to them, if you have it, Jesus says you should give it to them. Matthew 5, 42. Give to those who ask and don't turn away from those who want to borrow. God wants us to be generous. That's the opposite of stealing. Because stealing is always based on greed. And he says he'll make it worth our while when we're generous. He says, if you help the poor, you're actually lending to him. And he will repay you. These are supposed to be foundational ideas for followers of Jesus. Helping people should always be in the front of our mind. Don't forget to do good and share with those who are in need. These are the sacrifices that please God. You know, the first billionaire in the United States was John D. Rockefeller. And one time he was asked if he tithed to his church. And he said, yes, I tithe. And I would like to tell you how that came about. 
because I started working as a small boy to help support my mother. My first wages were $1.50 a week. And after the first week of work, I took that $1.50 home to my mom and she held the money in her lap and explained to me that it would make her very happy if I would give a tenth of that money to the Lord. And he says he did. He said for the rest of his life, he tithed every dollar that God entrusted to him. And he said if he hadn't tithed that first dollar he made, he wouldn't have been able to tithe the first million dollars he made. I'll bet there hasn't been a preacher who hasn't told that story and secretly wished a Rockefeller went to his church. (laughs) These days, people are afraid to talk about tithing. Pastors are afraid to talk about money. They're afraid to scare people away. Nobody wants to be accused of being in the ministry for money. But I'm more afraid of not teaching the whole truth of God's word, whether you like what it says or not, my friends. So, this is what God says about tithing. Buckle in. Malachi chapter 3. It says, will man rob God? Yet you are robbing me. But you say, how have we robbed you? In your tithes and contributions. You are cursed with a curse, for you are robbing me, the whole nation of you. Bring the full tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. And thereby put me to the test, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open the windows of heaven for you and pour down for you a blessing until there is no more need. Now, usually, God says not to put him to the test. But when it comes to paying our tithe, he's like, go for it. Do you want God to open the windows of heaven and pour down a blessing until you have no more need? Because that sounds like a pretty good deal for 10%. Sounds a whole lot better than being cursed with a curse for robbing him. So that's all a little sample of what the Bible tells us, what he says about cheating and stealing from each other and stealing from him. I think we've all done more than our fair share of cheating and greedy grabbing and stingy hoarding and lazy time wasting. I think we're all guilty, like across the board. And the world we live in has gone completely bonkers. In 2020, we've seen our elected officials steal the livelihood and dreams from our friends and neighbors by shutting down their businesses. And most of us have just passively watched all this insanity or maybe just complained about it to our friends. And then we've watched those same elected officials just stand by and allow the destruction and looting of people's businesses, livelihoods, and dreams. I mean, excusing the thieves, if not right out encouraging them. This is absurd. It's fear-mongering and deceit and condoned hatred. And it's all a mockery of God's justice. It's like a rebellious fist in his face. But what are we supposed to do? Where can we turn? There must be some kind of way out of here, said the joker to the thief. And there is. There is a way out. When Jesus was on trial, Pilate didn't want to find him guilty. He didn't want to deal with it. His wife had had a dream that Jesus was innocent. Pilate just wanted to make this whole thing go away. He said, I'll tell you what. 
I will give you people a choice. I will let you choose who goes free today. You can let Jesus, who as far as I can tell, hasn't done anything wrong and only wants to help you people. You can let him go free. Or you can have this other guy. And he picks like the worst, most notorious criminal that he had in custody. A guy named Barabbas, who it says was a robber, like a violent thief. The crowd chose Barabbas. The crowd always chooses Barabbas. So Jesus was executed. And he was crucified between two thieves. Thieves. It's like there's a pattern going on here. The people at the feet of the cross, they start making fun of Jesus. If you're the son of God, save yourself, loser. And then the thieves, they start joining in with the crowd. One of them starts mocking him. I mean, imagine that. This dude's being executed for crimes that he's guilty of. And he takes his last breath to yell insults at the one innocent person in the world. The other thief tells him to shut up. Says, are you out of your mind? What if he really is the Messiah, the Son of God? So he asks Jesus to remember him when he comes into his kingdom. And Jesus, who's dying on the cross for the sin of the world, he looks at him and he says, I will remember you. Today, you will be with me in paradise. That's a beautiful moment. Because here's the thing. You and me, we're Barabbas. We're the robber who gets to go free because Jesus takes the rap for us. We're also the thief on the cross who deserved to be there. And then Jesus, totally innocent, willingly sacrifices and dies so that he can say those beautiful words to you. I will remember you. You will be with me in paradise. You have been caught stealing, like red-handed. It's as simple as that. You're guilty. But here's the good news. Jesus has stepped up and paid your debt. You won't be charged for your crimes. You're going to get away with it. You're free to go. You can walk right through the door. How about if you use that freedom for good? To give instead of take. To spend your time wisely. To spend your money wisely. In Ephesians chapter 1, it says, In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, in accordance with the riches of of God's grace. Thanks be to God. Amen. If these online resources have been meaningful to you, please consider going to newchurchtx.com slash give and show your support by helping make this ministry possible. Thank you.